Hi, everyone. We will go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to our sixth uh, and final webinar in the Engendering International Waters webinar series. This is Sarah Davidson, the Manager for Water Policy at WWF US, talking right now. Um, I'm going to first start off just with the kind of boring things, the logistical and technical details. So um, we will be muting all attendees um, just to help with the sound quality. So you can use the chat box if you have technical difficulties at all, and we'll be checking that throughout the call. Um, and also, as we as we will have a few uh, places where there'll be an opportunity for discussion or to ask questions, go ahead and type your questions or comments anytime during the webinar into the, the chat box. And then we'll be able to take from there during those discussion portions. You don't need to wait to enter those. Um, I did also want to note, you may have heard this webinar is being recorded. So we can share it with anyone who misses it or in case any of you want to revisit the, um, the webinar or portion of the webinar again. Um, and just as a quick reminder, since it's been some time since our last webinar, um, almost a year now, um, or, of course, for some of you, this may be the first webinar in the series that you're joining. I'll just start us off with a really brief background. Uh, the Jeff-funded IW Learn project has included in its current cycle a gender subcomponent. The goal of that is to achieve increased recognition of gender issues and attention on gender equality throughout the Jeff International Waters project. So WWF is co-leading this subcomponent together with UNESCO's World Water Assessment Program. And you'll hear from some of us from all of those institutions throughout the call. The objectives um, for this webinar series, as well as um, a few face-to-face -face workshops that have accompanied this work, are threefold. The first is to accelerate learning on gender mainstreaming for the Jeff IW portfolio. The second is to provide access to training materials on common or important issues or challenges. And we'll direct you later in the seminar to where you can find some of those. And the third is to facilitate exchanges of experience, both in person and online, on gender integration. So that's very much what we will be doing today. We're looking forward to um, a good exchange, both with the panelists, but also with those of you who are able to join the call. Next slide. Um, and just as a reminder of where we've been so far together, as I said, this is the sixth and the final webinar in the series. The previous topics have included a general introduction to the topic of gender and water and those intersections. Um, World Water Assessment Program shared their toolkit on dis sex disaggregated data, water, and gender, and migration. Um, oh, sorry, uh, on data. Um, there was another, uh, the third webinar, I believe, was on water, gender, and migration. The fourth was on the interconnections between water, climate, and gender. And the last one in February of 2018 was on the linkages between SDG 5 on gender and SDG 6 on water. So today, as I said, is our concluding webinar. We will try to build on all of those previous webinars as well as the face-to-face -face workshops that we've held. Um, most recently at the Jeff International Waters Conference in Morocco in November. Hopefully some of you were there and this conversation will very much pick up and build on those. So that is what we'll be trying to do and tie together a bit over the next uh, approximately hour and a half. Next slide. I did just want to share really briefly another option for engagement for Jeff projects, um, not only in this subcomponent, but I have others in IW Learn is something called twinning. So that's really about arranging learning exchanges that allow for more in-depth sharing of experience on gender mainstreaming approaches than is possible just in a webinar format. So that can include support through trainings and workshops, implementation support, one-on-one -on -one project guidance, or seminars for a more targeted audience. Um, we're entering the final month of this phase of IW Learn, but if your Jeff IW project uh, could benefit from a twinning exchange, if you're interested in discussing more what that might look like around the particular issues related to gender mainstreaming in your project, please do reach out to us at WWF, World Water Assessment Program, or IW Learn, and our contact information will be on the, the final slide if you need that. Next 
And here's how we'll be spending the next 90 minutes. Um, we will, I'll just let all of you read that, we'll, but we'll have a number of presentations. Also, a couple of opportunities to hear from all of you on the call and discussion, and then um, as well some time for questions and answers with all of the panelists. Um, so as I said, please do make note of any questions you have along the way during the presentations. Um, go ahead and put those in the chat box anytime, and we'll use those to feed and kick off our discussion period. And I think with that, we'll start the, um, the panelists. Paola. Yes. Hi, everybody. This is Paola Piccione. I'm the gender specialist working at the UNESCO World Water Assessment Program, WAP, based in Italy. And uh, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about how to incorporate gender into a uh, Jeff IW project. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, can you click? Uh, yeah, thank you. You can click um, until the last box. Yes. Uh, you know, just to say that uh, uh, Jeff has been taking women's empowerment and gender equality uh, very seriously. And as you can see from the timeline on this slide, uh, gender mainstreaming efforts started in 2008 until the latest gender uh, equality policy published in 2018 which is operationalized in the guidance to advance gender equality in GIS projects and programs, as well as the gender implementation strategy. So this new, the latest policy stems from the results of an evaluation conducted in 2017 by the evaluation office of the, uh, G, of the GEF. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, this evaluation measured the extent and effectiveness of gender mainstreaming into GEF project since the implementation of uh, its first gender policy that was disseminated in 2011. Uh, the evaluation showed a significant decrease of gender blind projects after the adoption of the 2011 policy, as you can see in figure one. In the overall performance study, uh, gender-blind projects accounted for only 1.3% of total projects covered by the evaluation, meaning that most of the projects were gender-aware and gender-sensitive. However, the review of completed projects highlights a different scenario. In, in fact, if we focus on the uh, IW projects, um, you, you can see the uh, column on the right-hand uh, side, you will see that out of 25 projects, there is no gender mainstream project. Uh, this means that more than half of these projects were actually gender blind. And as a result of this recommendation, the latest gender policy came into effect in July 2018 and is in force for GEF 7. And it applies not only to all new GEF finance activities submitted after the date, but also to all projects implemented under the GEF 7. Next slide, please. But uh, the question is how do we move from policy to practice? Um, there are um, four strategic entry points for gender mainstreaming that are outlined in the latest. Uh, Jeff gender implementation strategy. The first one is supporting women's improved access, use, and control of resources. The second one is supporting women access to socioeconomic benefits and services. The third one is enhancing women's participation and role in natural resources decision making processes. Of course, when we talk about natural And the fourth one is about seeking targeted collaborations around knowledge and analytical efforts. Yeah, next one, please. Uh, now the uh, TDA, yeah, the Transboundary Diagnostic Analysis and the SAP, which is the Strategic Action program uh, represent an ideal framework for gender mainstreaming 
And as you know, the TDA is the analytical component that identifies and analyzes the transboundary problems, their impacts and causes, while the SAP is the strategic component that focuses, that focuses on strategic thinking, planning and implementation, and aims to address the problems identified in the TDA through policies and actions. Um, as you know, there is a comprehensive handbook on the TDA SAP process. There are several learning modules available on IW Learn. Um, so on the one hand, uh, the, the, we have the new GEF policy on gender equality. On the other hand, the TDA SAP methodology. So our question is, how can we link the new GEF gender policy with the TDA SAP methodology? Of course, this is a question that requires some thinking, some investigation, and we would like to share our preliminary uh, ideas with you. As you can see here, we have um, identified some areas that are uh, good in terms of gender mainstreaming in the TDA, sub, uh, TDA process, which are highlighted in pale blue. Uh, those are collection and analysis of data, determination of impact, and development of thematic reports. So let's go uh, very quickly uh, through them one by one. Uh, sorry, Sarah, can we go full screen again? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the first step, TDA step, that we have identified for mainstreaming gender is about the collection and analysis of sex segregated water data. Why do they matter? They matter for several reasons. Uh, first of all, because they allow us to produce scientific evidence on gender-related inequalities. They allow us to establish a baseline against which we can monitor and evaluate impacts. Um, we can examine how differences in, in gender roles, uh, power structures, power relations affect women and men, as well as girls and boys in a certain context. Um, uh, the collection and analysis of sex segregated water data is also very important to measure progress towards the achievement of the SDGs, of the Sustainable Development Goals, but also inform national and regional water policy frameworks, plans and, and programs to enable gender transformative actions in order to achieve the 2030 Agenda. The second step, uh, next slide please. The second step, TDA step, that we have identified uh, as a, a, a suitable one for mainstreaming gender is the so-called determination of impact. Um, let's take this example. Here we have identified a transboundary problem, which is eutrophication. Um, and of course, this problem may have several environmental impacts. One could be uh, reduced fish population. And the fact that the fish population is reduced uh, may have, of course, other uh, socioeconomic impacts. For instance, loss of income and loss of food source, uh, but also uh, health impacts due to the um, polluted drinking water. Of course, this is a gender blind example. What do we mean by gender blind? We mean that men's and women's different needs uh, have not been considered. So, Next one, please, next slide. Again, yeah. So um, by engendering the determination of impact, um, we can identify how men and women are uh, impacted differently by this transboundary problem uh, with the goal of identifying corrective measures and address possible gender inequalities. For instance, when it comes to health impact, we may want to ask ourselves if these impacts are different for men and women, and when it comes to loss of income and food source, we may want to ask ourselves whose, lives, whose livelihoods has been affected the most. Next one, please. The third TDA step that we have identified is, the, uh, is about the production of thematic reports, um, such as governance analysis, the stakeholder analysis, and the socioeconomic analysis. Now, the TDA uh, handbook is not prescriptive. Uh, these reports are strictly interlinked, and it's up to each project to decide which report should be produced. 
Uh, but for each thematic report, we have identified some, some um, preliminary issues, um, I would say, to be considered if we want to take into consideration gender issues. Um, for instance, when it comes to governance and water boards, we really, um, we should consider that numbers are not enough. We really need to analyze uh, what, what, what uh, role women play and what influence they have. Next one, please. And um, similarly to the TDA, the, the SAP has some key phases, uh, which are strategic planning, thinking, and the actual implementation phase. And of course, monitoring and, evalu and evaluation applies to all phases. Um, can you please click? Next slide. Yeah. And uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, TDA implementation, it's very important to come up with a specific gender action plan with specific actions, uh, targets, timeline, and of course, a gender responsive budget, uh, budgeting, meaning that specific resources should be allocated for gender related activities. Next one, please. So uh, we have shared our preliminary ideas at the uh, IWC9 in Marrakesh in November last year. Uh, we had a very uh, fruitful, fruitful discussion with, uh, with uh, participants. Um, and we have learned um, some, something, of course, that we would like to summarize in the following slide. Can you please? Yeah. Uh, so we have learned from participants at the IWC9 that the TDA sub process represents indeed an ideal framework for mainstreaming gender and that uh, it's, it's necessary to, to have a guideline to mainstream gender into, DAs, into the TDA sub process with concrete tools and tips in order to link the, T, the current TDA sub handbook with the latest Jeff policy on gender equality. At the workshop, we have also realized that the UNESCO WAP toolkit on water and gender um, provides a useful methodology, 107 gender responsive indicators and relevant questionnaires for gender analysis and for the collection of sex segregated water data that are actually aligned with the four priorities of the latest Jeff policy on gender equality. And uh, lastly, by using a gender lens, the UNESCO WAP indicators are a useful tool for the design, planning, monitoring, and evaluation of IW projects. Thank you. Lesha, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Paola. Um, I just saw um, a question passing by about what we mean by gender. Um, so, um, just not to take up too much time, I am um, uh, put in the chat box um, a link to the um, uh, gender flyer of WAP, um, so you can find some of the um, definitions and explanations there. So, what of course is very important to us is that um, we hear from you. Um, to know whether, first of all, you have any questions on what Paula just presented, but even more important, what you think would be the way forward. So what would you expect from us um, um, to try and do in the next phase? So one of the things we heard a lot um, is that people say, okay, this is very nice. We have all the, the formal, um, uh, definitions and gender mainstreaming policies. Now, what am I going to do with that uh, on the ground? So maybe somebody would like to kick off and tell us what you would need or what you would expect or the questions that you have. And if you want to um, jump in, you can either put it in the chat box or you can raise the little flag um, uh, in your menu, um, raise hand, it says, where you can flag us that you want to take the floor. So, so I, I take it. Yes. yes. 
Who wants to say? We hear somebody speaking, but we can't identify it. So, so if, if you're not wanting to speak, speak, put your mind. And, and the raise hand is underneath the list of participants. So can I ask if what Paula um, presented is clear to all of you? Or that you have um, uh, a question? to Paula or to anybody else. Hello? Lesha, I see a comment here from Mr. Ryan Latanova on the group chat. Maybe we can try to address that question. Which question is that? Yeah, yeah, he's asking how is, I'm reading what Mr. Uh, Latanova uh, uh, just wrote. He's asking how is gender defined within this webinar series and for the purposes of the project discussed? Is it defined as sex assigned at birth or gender identity? Or is there okay. another definition which is being used? I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I basically already answered that. One is that we use the term sex disaggregated data because of language issues, um, which means gender desecrated, sex desecrated, which doesn't mean necessarily the, um, uh, the sex at birth, but the roles that you um, and um, I, I put in a link in the chat box um, to where um, the definitions that are used in this project are uh, mentioned. Would that help you now, Ryan? Hello, Ryan? This is Sarah, just quickly, um, one other thing to note would be um, one other resource for Ryan or for others interest on this might be the Jeff policy itself, the Jeff gender, the new Jeff gender policy. You can see there, um, there's kind of a section for definitions um, that includes how Jeff defines gender. And then um, in, the, um, in the guidance document as well, there may be more on this. So um, what, what Lesha shared is um, from UNESCO's work um, and obviously then the Jeff gender policy provides um, an overview of the way Jeff is thinking about this and defining gender as well. Yeah, and you can find all this information also in our um, Dropbox, including the, 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 gen, the, the GEF gender policy. So maybe, Lawrence, you can share the link to that again so that people can look it up. Yeah, um, I, I could also uh, send it now in the chat box. Uh, otherwise, we, as we usually do, we follow up after the webinar and we send around an email to all the participants with some crucial information. I think it, at this point, maybe it's easier if we follow up in that way, no? Well, just put in the link to the Dropbox. Okay, I will put it then here. Um, anyway, so this is just um, to, to refuel the discussion, let's say. So if any of the participants are uh, enrolled or involved in IW projects, uh, we want to hear from you uh, what are the issues or needs that you experience for um, incorporating gender perspectives in your projects. So we are very interested to hear um, what is your opinion on this and let's discuss. Yeah. 
okay. What is unique about, um, ah, okay. Uh, Kanika, can I, can we address that question a little bit later in the webinar? Because we're going specifically to, to talk about gender mainstreaming in transboundary sessions. Uh, context, sorry. Um, and then if you have not heard an answer to that um, after the last presentation, please repeat your question. Is that okay, Kanika? Because it will be addressed in a, one of the later presentations. Okay, okay, thank you very much, Kanika. <coughs> So, any, anybody else? Because if not, we'll go to the next item. Okay. That means um, I'm introducing to you our next uh, speaker. Um, Anna Zastenko is the National Project Officer of OECE, the National Coordinator of the GET Project. Um, that is called Enabling Transboundary Cooperation and Integrated Water Resource Management in the Nyester River Basin. Um, and it was a joint project uh, of UNDP, OSCE, and UNECE. And um, Anna is the gender focal point in the project team. So Anna, I would like to take, uh, turn the floor over to you and to your colleague. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to tell you about the uh, gender mainstreaming in our project. Uh, and um, uh, we uh, hired a gender expert to help us to uh, prepare uh, the uh, gender uh, strategy for our project. And uh, I would like to share uh, some uh, things from this uh, strategy. So first of all, we um, had uh, gender contextual analysis of the riparian countries. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, yeah. And uh, what we got there, um, bo uh, both uh, uh, our beneficiary countries, Moldova and Ukraine, uh, have commitments to promote gender mainstreaming and national legislation uh, of both countries uh, declared gender equality. Uh, they proved that uh, uh, Moldova had the chapter in the strategy for ensuring equality between women and men in the Republic of Moldova for the years 2017-2021 uh, related to climate change and water, water uh, particularly. And the uh, uh, Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine adopted a decree on establishment of a position of the government uh, commissioner for gender equality policy. But uh, although uh, national, national legislation declares gender equality, um, gender equality in, enforcement in both countries faces uh, obstacles and uh, challenges. Um, in most cases, the women are underrepresented in the decision-making bodies and they have more obstacles to lead in the environmental domain. Next slide, please. Uh, well, uh, why is it important uh, to int introduce a gender uh, topic uh, into the project? Uh, this because uh, differences and inequalities between women and men influence uh, how individuals respond to changes in water resource management, uh, understanding gender roles, relations, and uh, inequalities can help uh, explain the choices people make and their uh, different uh, options. Uh, involving both uh, women and men in integrated water resources uh, uh, initiatives uh, can increase project effectiveness uh, and efficiency. Uh, next slide please. So uh, our uh, next slide next slide please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so our um, gender expert um, suggested us uh, uh, several uh, uh, potential entry points uh, for incorporation of the gender mainstreaming into the project. And uh, 
the most important of them uh, are uh, continuous striking of uh, women and men employed uh, and uh, in what positions uh, was monitoring the types of uh, competences they are engaged in uh, also including uh, uh, of the gender mainstreaming into uh, terms of references and uh, key deliverables uh, as part of the project framework uh, appointment of the gender focal point among the uh, project staff as we did um, considering uh, gender mainstreaming during planning of the project activities and ensuring that the budget is considered for, tar for targeted uh, gendered activities. Gender activities. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the main recommendations uh, and uh, tools, uh, particularly for our project, with, uh, which we got. Uh, first, uh, engagement uh, to the project implementation, formal and informal water managers or water leaders. Uh, we can uh, uh, engage them in the focus groups, uh, uh, in, invite to local consultations we uh, organize uh, and uh, uh, organize some uh, uh, additional informal meetings. Uh, to hear voices of informal uh, water leaders. Uh, the second recommendation uh, is uh, incorporation gender mainstreaming into projects, uh, uh, stakeholder involvement activities. Uh, for example, uh, councils and uh, expert groups uh, uh, or uh, prepare a separate ev event on gender mainstreaming. Uh, or include uh, gender component in different project activities. Uh, uh, we have such uh, activities like Dniester Day. This is the big celebration of uh, uh, Dniester Day every year. And uh, we were suggested to uh, include gender component into this uh, activity. Um, uh, the second activity is uh, the color of the Dniester art competition. This is art context uh, which uh, we organize uh, uh, also each year. And uh, we have there several uh, topics. Um, so we will include also gender component there. Uh, pro uh, the, the other tool is uh, produce uh, informational materials on gender for project staff and uh, stakeholders uh, to promote uh, the, uh, gender mainstreaming. Uh, the second slide, please. The other slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, other, no, no, uh, please return to that one. Please return to previous slide. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, another recommendation was uh, uh, professional development opportunities for project staff uh, to educate uh, us about uh, gender mainstreaming. Uh, to, so the uh, the other recommendation: uh, a strong education of public uh, or public uh, relations campaign related to gender mainstreaming and water management would be beneficial to the success of water management project as a whole. And uh, the last one is uh, gender mainstreaming communications to be very attentive to communications related to gender, to gender and uh, uh, to uh, produce only gender neutral messages uh, and uh, ask our stakeholders to do so. Uh, avoid uh, stereotypical roles of uh, women and men in informational materials, uh, especially uh, uh, any uh, visual materials uh, yeah, and uh, other uh, materials. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what do we have now in our project? Uh, 
our the staff of our project is mainly female uh, experts of the project both uh, male and female ratio is about the same uh, representatives of both genders have equal access to employment in our project uh, participants of the project events uh, and uh, all activities uh, also male and female ratio for some events is equal and in uh, some events where project cannot influence to the representatives slightly deviates toward the predominance of men this uh, I, I mean the events when uh, uh, countries uh, uh, ask us to uh, invite uh, people uh, invite uh, participants they uh, send the list to us. Uh, also, project is attentive to its uh, informational materials and avoid stereotypical messages uh, in our communications. Uh, all uh, calls for participation into the events supported by project uh, uh, encourage uh, women uh, to participate. And uh, as we all assume that uh, Basically, in terms of gender equality, our project's uh, status quo is not so bad. Uh, but of course, there are some gaps to fill in, and we're um, working on it continuously. Anna, sorry, this is just a, um, a reminder for you to wrap up because the, you're on your time. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. This was the last slide. Wow, uh, perfect timing then. <laughs> Okay, Anna, thank you so much. And I would have three questions for people to, to think about before we come to the Q&A later on. Um, one is the issue of timing. So when are you bringing in all these wonderful ideas you had uh, from the start or was it somewhere along the line? The second one is how does this play out in your budget? Does it mean you also have dedicated finances for this? And my third question would be, do you, apart from the numbers of people that um, attend, um, is there also a record of the interventions they made, the women made and the acceptance of their uh, of their ideas and and um, interventions. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to think about that um, uh, while we go to the next presentation. Um, so the our next speaker um, is um, our Veronica and Sebastian. I'm not quite sure who will take the lead on this. Um, they are both um, um, involved uh, at IWRM uh, projects. Um, Veronica is the national manager in, um, of a project implemented by PNUD and National Water Authority, Anna, in Peru. Um, and together, and they're working together with uh, the NACWA in Ecuador. Um, and Sebastian is the binational manager of this project. Um, so um, whoever is taking the lead on this, Sebastian or Veronica, please, you have the floor. And good morning, everyone. I am Sebastian, the project binational coordinator. With me is Veronica, who is the national coordinator of the project in Ecuador. Together, we will make the presentation. We will first look at the context of the integrated management project. Then we will review the, how the institutions integrate gender issues. Here we are going to see some information about uh, the de development of the project and the, uh, and the participation of the women. Then we will tell you about uh, an initial workshop to integrate gender issues into the project. And finally, uh, we we will explain the following steps on gender mainstreaming in the project. The next one, please. The next, please. Okay. Uh, 
other one. The, the other one, please. Yes, yeah. this one. The pro project seeks the strength of the institutional, political, legal, and scientific technical capacities of the implemented and integrated management of water resources in the transboundary basins and aquifers of three basins that we have with, uh, between Ecuador and Peru. The project is implemented by the National Water Authority of Peru and the Secretary, the Secretary of Water in Ecuador and the United National Development Program. Uh, we have three outcomes of the project with 10 results. The next one, please. Uh, the project is implemented in the uh, south of Ecuador and the north of Peru in the three hydrographic basins of, that discharge their waters into the Pacific Ocean. In addition, between the two countries, we are shared six other watersheds that go to the Amazon. The main activities of the population are related to agriculture, livestock, uh, and trade. Approximately one and a half million people live in the area of the influence of the project, on which more than 54% are women, due mainly to internal and external migration process to look for work. The next, please. So, uh, in terms of what we have about policies in the three institutions, a uh, United Nations Development Program uh, has a strategic plan in, what, in which it has defined a uh, six cross country signature solutions. One of these signature solutions have um, addressed a fundamental structural, structural barriers to gender equality. Uh, so these are the removing structural barriers to women economic empowerment, including women's disproportionate burden of unpaying work work, uh, preventing and responding to gender-based violence, and promoting women participation and leadership in all forms for decision-making. And finally, the strengthening uh, gender-responsive strategies in crisis, conflicts, and disasters, prevention and preparedness and recovery. So in order to provide a better solution, the United Nations Development Program has launched uh, its gender equality strategy. We which focus in supports the empowerment of women and girls through a targeted gender specific intervention and address gender concerns in development, planning and implementing and evaluating policies in all programs. So therefore developing its uh, local strategy, it's, it is developed in a local strategy and in implementing the gender equality seal program in order to make programming and operational change happen. This is in terms of our United Nations Development Program. Can so the you next please. Slow down your presentation. Okay, so. Okay, so the in terms about the institutions that are working in this, we have Senawa from Ecuador, who through a ministerial agreement, it was decided to apply a mainstream approach to gender in the framework of planning, regulation, control, and management of water resources throughout the structure of this. Uh, on the other hand, ANA from Peru um, has established it in its constitution, well, in Peru constitution, an equal opportunity between women and men law, which has to be applied by all the institutions. And also there is a supreme decree of the Ministry of Women and Vulnerable Population of Peru which indicates that in the public entities of national government and the regional governments, a commission, a commitment, or a group group, a working group, sorry, must be created uh, to work in gender equality. Yeah. The next, please. Now we're going to see some information about the gender and the project. In this case, uh, there are information about the Binational Commission for the Integrated Water Management. In this case, there are two members and there are only two women. Sebastian, sorry to interrupt, but I'm wondering if we're having a bit of a hard time hearing you. Could you get a bit closer to the microphone? Is it okay? Can you hear it? We can hear you. We can hear you. Um, Veronica, we can Sebastian hear you. Sebastian was a bit hard to hear. But Sebastian, not so well. 
Okay. Okay. Um, another one. In this case, we can see uh, the information about the Binational Commission for the Integrated Water Resource Management between Ecuador and Peru. In this case, uh, we can see that there are only there are ten members and only there are two women. Two women. This is uh, like an example. The, the next one, please. This is information about uh, the process, the TDA SAP process, uh, and the participation of the women in the workshops. In average, only 14% uh, of the participants has been women. The next one, please. And finally, uh, also the institution, in this case, Senawa, the, particip the participation of women in heads or technical roles is very limited. Less than 25% are women. Okay, so the next, please. So uh, what we got in the gender workshop so uh, the objectives of the of the aims of this workshop were to sensitive the participants about gender approach in the IWRM project and compile an inputs for the construction of a strategy to incorporate the gender approach in the project. So which were the participants? Well, it was a staff from the United Nations Development Program from Ecuador and Peru, the transboundary people, uh, the project, uh, the people from the project, the team project, uh, the people from the, the Senawa, and people from ANA from, from Peru. So it lasts around 10 hours, and it was the facilitator was a gender specialist from Ecuador, Natalie Trejo. The next, please. So uh, the results of the conclusions uh, were the next ones. Uh, first one, the support um, as a main conclusion, uh, sorry, about our result was the support, the incorporation of gender in Senawa to make it operational. The variables identified were public policies and indicators will be the participation of women in management position. Uh, some uh, risks that were identified was the resistance to change at all levels. The next result was the incorporation of young people and gender training. The variables were the generational capabilities and the indicators were the established schedules, spaces that allowed to involve men and women in the project. The risks were the generational conflicts. Um, uh, well, the other one I think it's important is the gender in ADT and PI, so it TDA and SAP, uh, uh, the variables were the public policies and indicate, indicator were also the inclusion of women in the process of socialization and constru construction of projects. Well, this is a good risk that is, it's quite um, uh, important to take into account the disrespect that probably could be creating some institution. And finally, as a result, we have the DCNA made project actions that benefit men and women. So variables were the irrigation, consumption, and sanitation. The indicator were workshops and manual shared work gender approach. And the risks were gender bias. So the main conclusions of the workshop were, all, um, uh, were all the development of workshop and manuals about gender issues, the participation of women uh, leaders, gender diagnosis, a training exchange of experience of develop of public policies. So the next please. So what we are going to do now, uh, the next steps of the project are, uh, we are going to develop a consultancy in which we are going to determine a uh, gene mainstream strategic for the project. Uh, the results that we expect of this one is an action plan, a proposal, uh, also a proposal of actions for training and validation of these GMS and also indicators. And where we are going to apply these GMS, uh, these gender mainstream strategic, we are going to 
apply this in the final phase of the project because we are now in the last year of the project. So it's going to be taken into account in the design uh, of the second phase of the project and also in the strengthening um, capacity workshop for the institutions involved in the integrated water ma uh, management of water resources. So um, thank you everyone. That was all. If you have any questions, they are welcome. Um, Veronica and Sebastian, thank you so much. Um, I would have a few suggestions for me for you to think about while we go uh, further. Um, one, I have to compliment you on the visuals because I see a lot of women in the pictures, which is a good thing because usually that's not the case. Um, but um, I would think um, you mentioned that um, there, there is legislation. So how effective is that legislation on the ground? Okay. Um, secondly, when I looked at the picture of the workshop, I see mainly women. So how are you reaching the men? Um, and is there any way that you measure not just the number of women who are there, but also their um, interventions and whether those interventions are accepted? Okay. Great, so you can, you can think about that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the meantime, um, I would like to go to uh, our next um, speaker, um, who is Maria Apostolova, and she is the PPG Regional Coordinator for the GEF Amazon Implementation Project. Um, and um, um, uh, working with uh, between UNEP and the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. Um, and I get the feeling that you have a lot of experience, Maria. So please um, let us know your thoughts. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lesha, and good afternoon to uh, everyone. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, in fact, uh, we are the largest river basin uh, in uh, the world, and I like to see the queen of the river basins, but we don't have that much experience uh, in our project in uh, uh, mainstreaming um, uh, gender issues, but we are in a process of learning, and uh, 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 turning point uh, was uh, our participation in Marrakesh uh, in the workshop uh, organized uh, by the World Water Assessment uh, uh, Program of UNESCO together with IW Learn and other organizations. Uh, so we have picked up uh, uh, the the gender uh, flag, and uh, we want uh, to advance. Uh, in our next phase uh, of the project. So uh, the, as you know, the, the Amazon River Basin is the largest uh, uh, in the world. Uh, there are with uh, more than 7 million square kilometers uh, of extension and it's the home of uh, more than uh, 40 million uh, uh, people, uh, uh, roughly 50% uh, uh, women and 50% uh, uh, men, a little bit more uh, women. Uh, including uh, uh, 420 indigenous uh, people and uh, its uh, largest tropical forest and megadiverse uh, region uh, of the world with uh, approximately 20% of the world freshwater discharge uh, into the ocean. Uh, next, please. Uh, next slide. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have uh, just finished uh, in... Uh, uh, December uh, uh, 2018, uh, uh, GF uh, project uh, on water resources and climate change. Uh, uh, the project uh, uh, was with uh, GF support in partnership between the UN Environment and the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization, uh, which is an intergovernmental organization 
of the eight uh, sovereign states uh, which uh, share the Amazon basin, and these are Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, and uh, Venezuela. Uh, the main objective of uh, this project was uh, uh, to prepare a strategic uh, action program for the basin for the first time. The eight countries uh, came together in uh, this effort, and uh, uh, the sub process uh, was conducted uh, between 2014 and 2015 uh, uh, based uh, on a comprehensive uh, public participation process uh, through 11 national workshops, five regional workshops, uh, 12 pilot uh, projects uh, uh, which were implemented uh, it's difficult to see but they're uh, on the map uh, showing that the they were distributed all over uh, the basin and also some targeted studies on the important uh, uh, issues uh, for, um, uh, for the TDA formulation and respectively for the stop. Something else that was uh, uh, done uh, in our case was a broad public opinion survey uh, which was conducted uh, in the basin countries uh, with uh, 8,700 uh, interviews and focal groups and uh, different kinds of uh, methodologies uh, to incorporate uh, the, uh, the opinion and the vision of the local population and the Amazonian society in uh, uh, to the TDA uh, SAP uh, process. Uh, well, next please. Yeah. Thank you. In terms of including uh, a gender perspective and mainstreaming uh, gender in uh, the project implementation, uh, I could say uh, this is, uh, has been a process at uh, the project design in 2006, 2007, 8. Uh, there was uh, no clear concern about including a gender perspective uh, and mainstreaming gender. Uh, but this issue become, became more relevant uh, during uh, project uh, uh, execution. And uh, in uh, this sense, it has been uh, uh, very important uh, uh, to follow the international agenda on this issue, in, and more particularly uh, our involvement uh, uh, through the GF uh, and the IWLEARN uh, uh, targeted. Uh, activities and uh, IWCs. In terms of uh, the project uh, uh, implementation, uh, the points uh, we can highlight is um, uh, the gender balance in project uh, implementation in terms of uh, the PCU uh, composition and also uh, in, in the team of main consultants. Uh, we also had the, the team of national assistants in all countries and there was a uh, gender balance uh, between, if we consider all, the, all of them. Also, uh, gender balance in the workshops and um, project activities. Uh, uh, in the uh, regional uh, workshops, uh, we had uh, a, a significant gender uh, balance. Uh, and also in the technical workshops, in the PC, uh, in the project steering committee, uh, meetings. Uh, in the national opinion polls, uh, women represented 50.7% uh, 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 while on the average uh, in, the, uh, in the local and regional uh, uh, in national workshops, uh, the participation uh, uh, was uh, between 40-42% uh, uh, for women and uh, uh, respectively, uh, 58, 60 percent uh, for men. Uh, when uh, we came to uh, the final process of sub uh, formulation, uh, a gender uh, equality uh, and gender mainstreaming, uh, we we became more more aware as a as a project uh, uh, coordination unit. Uh, of, uh, of the need 
of mainstreaming uh, gender and including in this first strategy uh, for the management of water resources uh, in the Amazon. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Ed, uh, during the TDA process, uh, uh, gender was not sufficiently considered. And then uh, in the SAP, uh, there are some entry points for, uh, uh, for gender mainstreaming, which are the gender equality requirements for the strategic actions. Uh, also, uh, uh, as the SAP relates uh, to the SDGs and uh, follow the discussion of uh, the sustainable development goals in the Agenda 2030, uh, it uh, also benefited for, uh, uh, for the gender approach. And uh, so gender mainstreaming as a part of uh, the public participation uh, strategy in the South. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to highlight some of the challenges uh, uh, we have uh, faced uh, in the project. Uh, first, uh, the limited knowledge of uh, how to include gender mainstreaming throughout uh, the project cycle and uh, what results uh, uh, to expect uh, from this where we were really uh, not sufficiently prepared uh, and uh, we had not budgeted uh, or planned uh, to have a gender uh, mainstreaming specialist uh, to help us out. I see that other projects have been uh, more lucky in the, that issue and if this is a good lesson learned to, uh, to apply in the projects. Uh, also, the, at the time, the absence of uh, specific methodology to orient us uh, how to mainstream gender in the TDA sub uh, process, uh, both at the regional and national levels, um, because, uh, uh, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, now uh, this is uh, on the uh, on the agenda, and uh, we'll probably have uh, for the next projects uh, a, a methodology uh, on this issue, and also uh, limited national policies in some of the riparian countries uh, in relation to the gender issues, uh, specifically in the context of uh, water management managing. Uh, and sometimes gender is uh, not a priority issue for the national counterpart uh, uh, institutions. Next, please. Uh, currently, we are in the phase uh, of uh, preparing uh, a project on uh, SAP implementation. And uh, in this sense, uh, uh, we uh, have uh, committed uh, uh, to including uh, uh, gender in, uh, in this new project, uh, in the different uh, uh, components of the project, uh, and also as a cross-cutting issue. Uh, so in these terms, we, uh, we are including a gender analysis at uh, our project uh, inception. And uh, also we have uh, uh, four components uh, and uh, uh, each one uh, will uh, consider gender mainstreaming. First uh, uh, one in the uh, relation to strengthening national policies and institutional capacity uh, building as uh, part of our first component. Uh, also including gender dimension and women's empowerment uh, through national intervention projects uh, on uh, water management and climate change uh, uh, adaptation. Uh, also, we have a uh, uh, significant component on environmental monitoring. And uh, in this sense, uh, uh, we are trying to formulate, uh, or at least to plan for, uh, gender sens sensitive water environmental monitoring and assessment indicators and uh, uh, also for our sub implementation uh, monitoring uh, system, a gender sensitive uh, uh, methodology and indicators. Uh, also in the 
uh, you have a few strategies uh, planned uh, uh, and uh, we will include uh, gender both uh, in communication, uh, public participation and uh, sub-positioning uh, strategies uh, that are planned for the project. Uh, uh, also, uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, in the part of strengthening of uh, the organization, the, the actor, which is the basin organization, uh, uh, activities have been planned to, uh, to formulate an agenda and a strategy uh, to be implemented uh, through the basin organization and to strengthen this, the uh, issue uh, in the context of ACTO. Currently, there is no strategy and uh, there are no even guidelines uh, uh, or requirements on uh, gender mainstreaming uh, in, at the regional level. Uh, the project will also include a gender sensitive community training program, uh, which will be uh, executed in partnership uh, with the small grants program. And uh, uh, we see this uh, as an opportunity to work both at the local level uh, in the eight countries uh, and also relating uh, water and uh, uh, gender. Uh, as part in, of our activities, uh, we have an updating and uh, a supplement uh, to the TDA ISAP, and we are planning uh, uh, to correct uh, our, uh, our previous project by including uh, uh, into the SAP uh, now our specific uh, strategic action uh, on the on gender mainstreaming. This is something that uh, is not there, and also uh, conducting uh, a gender assessment on uh, gender and water uh, to complement uh, our TDA uh, document, which. Uh, as I mentioned, was uh, has not considered uh, the gender perspective. And this was all. Thank you very much. Well, Maria, thank you very, very much uh, for two. One, it was a great presentation, but also because you've been so honest with us to say, okay, this is what we did first. And because of the discussions and um, things we learned in the meantime, we are going to adjust our, our project. So I think you have to come up with some great uh, recommendations. Um, what I would like you to sort of think about um, is uh, one responding to a question we got earlier. If you look at the Amazon, there is a high diversity of cultures and backgrounds. So would that make a difference in your responses? Um, and the, the second one would be a question I asked earlier to one of the other presenters as well. Um, numbers of people present is very important, but what happens to meaningful participation and um, acceptance of um, interventions that the women made. So having that said that, thank you very much again, Maria. Um, and I'll go straight to another um, yeah, sort of input and that's um, uh, from resulting from um, uh, some um, research that was done by IUCN and Women for Water Partnership, um, looking at women as change makers in the governance of shared waters, because that's a lot of what we're addressing and has been addressed by the previous panelists. Um, so one, I think, is, is very clear, and it came out as well from, from these presentations, um, is that there is um, not enough attention to women's participation and gender equality when it comes to governance, and there's also very little research on it. 
But we also know that there is a lot of um, activities that women are actually doing on the ground um, that might not get enough attention. And as um, two of our previous speakers said, there is, there is legislation in place. There are um, uh, frameworks to work with, but for some reason, um, they're not used. Um, and one part of that might be that uh, transboundary water governance is seen as a very much as a state to state matter and not so much as a as a matter of women living across um, the um, uh, living across the the river so can we go to the next slide this is basically what I already talked about so we can go to the next slide so the funny thing is that we know that um, women have a lot of experience in uh, innovation and use of sharing resources. Um, they have a lot of also traditional knowledge, as you were referring to, Maria. Um, and they have lots of very interesting um, informal networks that can actually help to disseminate and contribute uh, towards cooperative solutions. Um, so paying attention to the national policy is extremely important, but also um, paying attention to what is actually happening across river is extremely important. Are they actually talking to each other? Next slide. So, as was said also by previous um, panelists, one of the problems is that there are um, lacks in the national frameworks, not paying attention to the, the women's and gender components, uh, which makes it not easy to, um, yeah, to incorporate um, these issues in the transboundary uh, projects. There are loads and loads of stereotypes and cultural norms um, involved. And these are, some of them are local, some of them are transboundary, but also some of them are different between the riparians. So that doesn't make it easier. And last but not least, uh, one of the big uh, problems is the land and resource tenure and, and ownership. So most of the time, land ownership it also means whether or not you will have access to water resources. Um, but it's also um, curtailing the, the opportunity of women to, to be visible and, and contribute to their own um, local and national economy. Next. So one that was already mentioned by one of the panelists is to make sure that if there are national plans, um, the voluntary national reports, the um, SDG coordination, that some of these um, issues are uh, addressed in a combination of the targets of SDG 6 and SDG 5. And in the context of today, um, especially 6.5 and 6.6. Um, and another one is that um, to make sure that um, the women have equal rights. And this is, of course, a long term uh, project. It's not something you can do overnight. But if it's part of your original design of the project, that you also speak to transboundary river basin authorities, to national governments about these issues, then it actually might result in different, uh, also uh, uh, formal procedures. Next slide, please. So one is the effective participation. And some of the questions I asked earlier were sort of pointing to that. Um, being there in terms of numbers is extremely important, but the most important part is being heard. 
and your, the contributions of the women being acknowledged in this decision-making processes. Because that's, in the end, is what gets you a result. Um, and the second one is to actually acknowledge work that women are already doing. There are loads of projects, small-scale projects, yes, um, that are exactly addressing all these types of issues. But lots of times they're not seen as such. So, for instance, local women's organizations that are doing something about strengthening riverbanks or planting trees is not seen as part of the, the water resource uh, management. Um, but that's basically ignoring a lot of very effective strategies that women use um, to help with um, integrated water resource management. Next. So one is, and I think our first panelist was referring to that, um, having more women to get access to vocational training and actually become paid professionals in the water sector is extremely um, important. And in a lot of cases, it could easily be part of the, the projects that you are designing. The second one would be to... <coughs> <clears throat> to ensure that the women's networks that are there um, get strong enough to um, yeah, to continue their their interventions, but also to communicate with others. And in that case, a peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, support, which would also be um, helped by... Um, the, the twinning program um, would also be very helpful. And last but not least, uh, acknowledge the traditional and indigenous knowledge that, that's actually there. Next. So I think I talked about most of these um, recommendations and I think um, we will we'll make this um, all available to you, to all of you. So, um, um, and there are some links in this presentation as well to other resources. Next. So here are some of the resources, some of the connections. Um, and this is what we, um, what we can offer you for the future to have a look at. And there's more stuff there available. Thank you. So my friends, having said all that, um, I would like to go back to you and give you a um, uh, possibility to answer the questions I put earlier or other questions that some of our uh, participants may have. So who can I give the floor? One of our panelists first to, to respond to some of the questions. Maria or Veronica or who would like to go first? Okay, well, I could be the first one. Um, well, you got uh, you asked me three questions in Malaysia. So the first one was about well, it was like um, a vision that in all the pictures you can see the presence of women and men, but yeah, um, as you can see in some pictures, there the majority, the I guess in the main workshops, the presence of, of men were the principal. I, I guess they were a lot, a lot of, of men. So, uh, but in the gender uh, workshop, um, it was like homogeneous presence of women and men, and it was nice. And it was the the conclusion of this a workshop uh, the the um, I don't know the advices and the conclusions about this workshop were developed uh, for both for women and men. So we got a heterogeneous a response about it. I think it was a great uh, aim that we got there. 
Uh, also, as your second question was about the policies, if they are really are applying nowadays. Well, as you know, sometimes um, in these institutions could be a kind of hard to apply all these kind of policies because most of the time there are the, the presence of men are bigger than the presence of women, so it could be hard. So nowadays it's, yeah, the policies are limited. The application of the policies are limited. So one of the aims of our project is to strengthen actions about its application in mainly in the institutions that we work for. And finally, uh, your last question was how to handle, how to handle the workshop with the presence of men or women, I think. I am right, is it okay? Leisha? I can hear you very well, no problem. Okay, yeah, um, I guess uh, I understand about your last question was how we can reach uh, women and men in our workshops. Uh, well, the main focus on our workshops it's, um, as you know, for women could be sometimes harder than for men because of children. And we are looking for safe places for them. So one of the parameters that we take into account for the workshops are these ones. Safe places, access, an accessible schedule for women, uh, knowing working hours. And also, if women have children, we are trying to look for a way that they can come with the children and the children have a space. Uh, meanwhile, the mothers uh, join us in the workshop. And always trying to do now in two days, uh, no more than one day, the workshops and no more than a few hours. Because, you know, for women, it's quite uh, hard to travel to a place to sleep away from home. So that's all these are the parameters that we take into account. So I, I don't know if I answer all your questions or you do have some other observation? Well, you're doing fine. I would just have one, one additional question. What happens with, if you want Great. to do childcare um, or, or, you know, or you want to get them there, do you, do you have a, a new budget to actually help them with transport? And yeah. I guess it, it's because the lesson learned. Oh, do you mean about the budget about it? Yes, yes. Yeah, I guess the budget includes all these. The, the, we got our workshop um, budget. We have a budget for all the workshops. So if we are going to do this, uh, we are going to have like some budget um, just for this, just for the, the children yes, care. No, it's about the children care. Uh, so it's about... Uh, for the children care of in the in the meanwhile of the worship. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, can I can I have one of the other panelists also respond to the questions? Maria or Sebastian or Anna? May I please uh, answer? Yes. Uh, please. Um, you asked me about the budget also, so I, I want to say that uh, we don't have a special uh, sub separate budget for uh, pure gender activities uh, for now, but uh, uh, we uh, will try to include uh, uh, gender uh, mainstreaming into our... our and, uh, would you go or do I go? Actions. Yes. Sorry? Sorry, I think Anna was speaking. Yeah, may I continue? Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, we'll try to uh, include uh, uh, gender topic into our uh, already planned uh, uh, activities. Uh, and uh, then um, uh, when we um, prepare our uh, 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 strategic action program will uh, try to engage also um, try to include uh, gender into that uh, regarding the um, uh, interventions and uh, acceptance of uh, uh, women's uh, uh, ideas uh, uh, i would like to say that uh, one of our uh, co-heads of uh, Nestor commission is uh, female and uh, also we have many 
female uh, experts and uh, I don't think that we have any differences uh, between uh, uh, women and men uh, uh, proposing their ideas in our project. We accept uh, uh, them uh, equally. Uh, also, I would like to uh, clarify the question regarding the timing. Could you please uh, repeat it? Sorry, say that again, Anna. You asked me about timing, but I uh, didn't get... Uh... Ah, okay. Um, I think that was mainly because you said that some of these um, ideas came afterwards, after you had finished your official um, design of the program. Um, yeah. I thought it was very good that one of your recommendations was to make sure that these considerations are already in the project design and not afterwards. Uh, yeah, the, the, this uh, uh, strategy, uh, gender strategy was uh, made uh, after the project uh, has started. So um, yes, we, uh, we couldn't plan this uh, uh, activities. Uh, uh, and uh, now we, um, we, uh, we will do everything we can within our current uh, plan and current budget. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there was a question here about gender blindness um, and um, what variables determine gender blindness. Is there anybody who would like to react to that? Maybe Paula, would you like to react to that? Uh, yes, sure. Um, when we talk about gender blindness, we talk about uh, projects, programs, uh, policies, or even um, attitudes um, that do not take into account the different roles and needs that women and men have. So I would say the key uh, variables would be the different roles and needs that women and have um, that men and women have. And by doing so, we basically maintain the status quo and we will not help transform the unequal structure of gender relations. So if you ask somebody, is this a sen gender sensitive uh, topic? and they say no, then you're out of it, right? Sorry, Lesha, then you are? Then you're out of it. I mean, if the, 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 the question uh, simply invites a yes or a no. So, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. then, then there's no debate, right? So it's exactly. also very important how you ask the question, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And if, if, if for instance, if we skip uh, the focus to the uh, program or project level, we know that there are several uh, ways of categorizing how we mainstream gender, right? Um, we have gender blind, as we said, projects. So in, in those types of projects, gender is not even mentioned in, in, the, in the programs, right? There's no reference to gender. Then we have, for instance, gender neutral projects in which gender is mentioned, but is not a focus of, the, of that particular program or project. Then we have a gender aware program, project or policies in which gender issues are clearly integrated throughout the strategy of that program or, or that policy. And then we have uh, the gender transformative programs or policies which, in which gender issues are clearly integrated and go beyond the problem description um, and basically the ultimate goal of that program or policy is to transform the unequal power relations. Yeah. So we, we have a scale of possibilities, I would say. Okay, that seems to be um, very clear to me. Um, there was one more question and then I go to our next, next presentation um, uh, about transboundary setting, whether that's, that's different from others. Well, one of them is that it's transboundary. 
and most of the policies and projects are basically national. So they do not incorporate uh, concerns that have to do with the fact that you are living at a river or a lake or, or an aquifer for that matter um, that is crossing borders and might encompass other policies and other um, concerns. So I think this is a, a really um, a very important thing that one of the areas is to make sure that if you design this type of projects that you actually connect the women's organizations in the different countries and not just look at the national perspective. But I'm not sure who asked the question, but I'm happy to elaborate more um, um, offline when we have a little bit more um, attention uh, and time. So um, having that said that, and in the interest of time, I would like to give the floor to Lawrence, who is part of the team of the um, World Water Assessment Program, and give us um, a teaser. Yes. Please, Lawrence, go ahead. Thank you, Lesha. Yeah, hello everyone. So as I said, I'm Lawrence Dye and I work as a gender and communication consultant uh, for UNESCO WAP. And uh, I will be giving you a short teaser on our 2019 WAP Water and Gender Toolkit uh, that's on sex disaggregated data. And we will be releasing this uh, new toolkit on May 13 and 14 during the International Water Conference of UNESCO in Paris. Um, next slide, please. So I'll try to keep it short. Uh, basically, in line with the UNESCO Global Priority, uh, we as WAP are committed to advancing women's empowerment and gender equality in the water we all. And therefore, in 2014, we started a major gender initiative that aims to achieve a global standard for sex segregated water assessment, monitoring and reporting. And we aim to create a universal baseline knowledge on water and gender. So you can see here in the slides, these are the objectives, the exact objectives. Um, first of all, to, to bridge this gap that currently exists in the field of sex disaggregated water data. And how can we bridge it? We can do so by collecting this data, of course. Um, as the lack of this sex disaggregated data, it's a huge obstacle to the production of scientific evidence on gender inequalities related to water. And also uh, an obstacle to the formulation of fit evidence-based policies. Um, then further, we aim for building capacity for the collection of sex disaggregated water data. And we aim to provide uh, tools um, to users um, in different regions and different climates with different backgrounds. Uh, then lastly, um, we aim to contribute to the achievement of the 2030 agenda with our homemade indicators that complement these sustainable development goals. Uh, next, please. Um, therefore, um, WAP was helped uh, during this initiative by the WAP expert group on sex disaggregated indicators um, that consisted of 35 experts. And together with them, we produced a groundbreaking methodology and the list of high priority indicators for gender sensitive water assessment, monitoring and reporting. And then uh, based on all this, in 2015, the first edition of the, the WAP toolkit on sex segregated water data collection was uh, released. And as you can see, this toolkit consisted of four tools. The first one being the methodological framework, then uh, the second one containing the key indicators, which are together contained in one publication. The tool tree is um, on the guidelines on how to gather this data in the field. And the fourth is a practical tool with which you can actually collect the data in surveys. Next one, please. Um, so as you can see in this slide, this 2015 WAP toolkit has received 
international recognition and also adoption on several occasions um, throughout the years of 2014 until 2018. Next, please. And uh, basically, um, next to these recognitions, also the formulation of the new 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development um, led WAP um, to, to continue doing this work and to actually produce uh, a next work, uh, so the 2019 toolkit. Um, again, you can see that we have four tools which are now all contained in separate uh, publications. Um, with the first one being on the new indicators that are structured in 10 priority topics. Uh, the second is the revised and updated methodological framework. Uh, the third are the guidelines for collecting uh, data in the field, uh, which um, include important inputs that we collected during uh, actual field work that has been done and lessons learned. And then the fourth one is the questionnaire to collect uh, data in surveys. And uh, again, here the questionnaire has been expanded and refined based on, uh, on our experience. And next, please. So here I want to show you the difference in terms of indicators. Uh, here you can see the 2015 uh, edition that had 40 priority indicators that were divided in five topics being water governance, safe drinking water, sanitation and hygiene, decision making and knowledge production, transboundary water resource management, and finally water for income generation for industrial and agricultural uses. And then if we go to the next slide, we see Yes, here we see uh, that the 2019 edition has no less than 107 indicators that are uh, divided in 10 topics. And you could see that there are a few brand new indicator topics such as human rights-based water resources management, water migration, displacement and climate change, then indigenous and traditional knowledge and community water rights, and finally, water education and training. Next, please. So as I before uh, briefly mentioned, these new indicators that were developed to- Do you need to wrap up? Yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up. Um, they were developed to go hand in hand with the new 2030 agenda. And uh, of course, to accelerate achievement of the SDGs. Um, so here you can see a, a short overview um, on how each indicator priority topic is basically uh, interlinked to not just one, but also multiple uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we came to the end here. And um, please, I, I would like to invite all of you to keep in mind this date of 13 and 14 May, um, on which we will launch the 2019 Gender Toolkit during the International Water Conference at UNESCO HQ. Um, and that's it, Lesha, back to you. Okay, thanks very much, Lawrence. And please all keep uh, track of this.